afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, RF Filter Topology Constraints, Electrical Performance versus Mechanical Size. My name is Kendall Paradise, and I'm the President at Epic Engineer Technologies. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you all know that you'll be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions as we move along, please enter them into the questions panel located in the webinar control panel, and we'll try to get to them all at the end of the presentation. If we don't have time to go through all your questions, we'll be sure to reply back to you via email. Also, we'll be recording this webinar and it will be posted to both, sorry, we'll be posting both the recording and slides on our website and YouTube channel. Our presenter today is Mark Stanley, our RF product manager. In this role, Mark works directly with customers to ensure the highest quality RF products. He is involved from the point of sales inquiry through design stages, manufacturing, product verifications, and final delivery to our customers. Mark brings over 20 years of successful business creation and enterprising sales, design and manufacturing experience, strategic partnering and business development, as well as team building and OEM relationships. Prior to joining Epic, Mark was the president of Putnam RF Filters, Inc. Putnam was founded in 2008 in Manchester, New Hampshire as a product engineering group for emerging technologies designed to serve the military and aerospace space industry. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Mark. Thank you, Kendall. Uh, so welcome to our filter topology constraints discussion. Uh, today we're going to compare and contrast uh, two design approaches against one filter specification and dig into how these topology choices can affect performance and size of the final design configuration. So on the agenda today is to review the specific filter requirement goals and we're going to discuss the technology of the chosen SSS and LE design approaches. Uh, and, and going forward here for easy use and maybe more for my ability to say suspended substrate strip line more than once cleanly because of the alliteration, uh, we will use acronyms SSS and LE uh, for the substrate and lumped element. Uh, um, moving on, we're going to go to the design reviews of both the SSS and the LE. Uh, we are then going to compare and contrast the effectiveness of each design. And lastly, we will field some questions from the participants. Looking now at the filter specs, we first have the application. Mission critical. This is a fairly self-explanatory term, but for anyone not familiar with it, mission critical means that the functionality is essential to the survival of a mission. It means that the success of the mission cannot be compromised by the failure of a system component. When a mission critical system fails or is interrupted, operations are or can be severely impacted. When operations are impacted, there's the very real possibility or even the likelihood of loss of life or minimally serious physical injury. So this unit will be operating on a mobile platform in very harsh environments. Uh, it'll be on vehicles such as Bradley's, Abrams, Strikers, uh, even on presidential motorcades when they're in the field. On the mechanical side, it, it's a very small package for the broadband frequency that, that it's going to be subjected to. Uh, the length is not that much of an issue at uh, two and a half inches. Uh, the width is a little more difficult at three quarters of an inch just because there's a lot going on in here as we'll, we'll get to. Um, and the height, well that's dictated by the connectors. So this has got SMA connectors on it and, and that is means that the housing is the exact height of the connector flange uh, which just means really that we have to uh, have tight manufacturing controls in order to be sure that we, we meet mechanical spec. Uh, on the environmental side, uh, this is a pretty standard uh, for the end use, of course, uh, and, and regarding mill spec, but they're still pretty rugged temperature specs. Uh, the vibe is for the tracked vehicles like the Bradleys and the Abrams. And on the production requirements, 100% verification testing pretty much is indicative of mission critical product anyway. But what we have is for power ESS and RF verifications, uh, 
really points to extremely high reliability and extremely high expected service life. And on these types of products, mission critical wise, it's not uncommon to see an MTBF, uh, which is mean time between failures. Uh, there's ratios and things that determine that, but the number that we'll see on something like this could be upwards of 500,000 hours. Uh, not that the product will ever be in service for 50 years uh, or 500,000 hours, but there is design expectation that, that it could be. Uh, so that's just, again, indicative of, of the application uh, overall. So our specification goals. In, in general, this is a very high achieving filter. Uh, it's got a broadband operation of 2.5 to 6 gigahertz. Uh, you'll notice that there are some aggressive guard bands. Uh, we've got a DC to 2 gigahertz and a 6.8 to 12 gigahertz guard band uh, for rejection. Um, so again, very aggressive in that sense relative to the uh, the passband. The loss spec is achievable at the 1.5 dB. The rejection is also achievable at 50 dB. Uh, again, high performing but achievable. Our return loss or the VSWR, surprisingly a little bit relaxed here at 12.73 uh, or 1.60, 1.6 VSWR. Uh, but, but again, um, considering the, the frequency range uh, achievable. The, the power handling, on the other hand, is uh, they've got specs here that are frequency defined, and those are the specific operation frequencies that this unit will be subjected to. Now, it, it'll be a swept condition where it'll be using all of the passband, but these are the most uh, highly used or high duration cycle time for those power uh, demands. Uh, so that, that's, that's going to be obviously a very critical piece of this, uh, difficult for the package size, and thermal management is going to be the key on this. So moving on to the SSS technology itself, what we look at from this design side is that the SSS is really a distributed element. Uh, the SSS filters consist of both series and shunt transmission line sections. Uh, the dielectric is between two cross-sectional metal channel ground planes and it's in air except for the substrate areas. The, the substrate maintains the printed strip line circuit and suspension between the two ground planes. And what this gives us is a number of things. One is high Q. So the two parallel ground planes with, with most of the electric field operating in air provides that, that Q. And the Q is a measure of efficiency, and the efficiency is energy loss. So the higher the Q, the lower the loss, uh, which is good, and the sharper the band edges, which is also good. The SSS structure is also gives us a, a flexibility in design. Uh, we have circuit patterns that are deployed on both sides of the substrate. Uh, which gives us some flexibility in how we, we uh, design those particular structures. Uh, and then we have a, a, a metal housing that protects the circuit against environmental uh, electromagnetic interference and prevents the circuit from radiating into the exterior space of the system that it's installed into. Uh, the SSS also gives us broadband capability uh, that is uh, suitable uh, for uh, this application. Uh, typically, units of, of, of this design exhibit less than 1 dB of loss in the passband and 60 dB of rejection, again, which fits right into our spec goals. Um, there is less loss associated with this design overall and better rejection uh, than a microstrip or any other strip line design. And lastly, our temperature. The, the, the SSS has a unique ability uh, to withstand severe vibration requirements and extreme operating temperatures. And that is because of the mechanical structure uh, and the printed structure uh, of the printed circuit board uh, that is sandwiched within this housing and it's all bolted together. So it's a, a very uh, robust design in that sense. Now to the lumped element or low E technology. 
So the lump element filters, these are constructed with high Q, again, all high Q, right? We need high Q in order to have low loss. Uh, so they're all, all of the parts, whether they're printed or, or surface mount, are going to be a high Q uh, type of product that we're going to choose. Um, anyway, these are constructed with high Q chip capacitors, mostly porcelain, multi-layer, uh, very high performance, uh, and also air-spaced uh, coils for inductors. And again, that's versus the printed structures in the SSS design. Uh, the term lumped element is really derived from the fact that the inductor and capacitor uh, at each node or is, is really lumped into a, you know, quote unquote lumped into an individual surface mounted component. Um, it's then soldered to an RF or microwave specific copper clad substrate. Uh, so the advantage of these filters can, can be made quite small at lower frequencies and that's where they, where they really thrive. Uh, where a cavity or a suspended substrate filter uh, might be larger due to longer wavelengths associated with the lower frequencies. Uh, but the high-end frequency limit of these filters is in the range of maybe 10 gigahertz or so. Um, and it's limited really more by the availability of practical components. Um, at these frequencies, the sizes of the components become extremely small, and, and that limits the, the, the practical accuracy and quality of the part. Um, as a wide bandwidth lumped element bandpass filter, it, it, this particular design can be implemented by cascading a low pass and a high pass section in the same housing. Um, the insertion loss and the stop band rejection specs, these can be achieved, but the downside overall is going to be a larger size with increased complexity. There is a, a thermal uh, equation here, of course, uh, the achievable, achievable uh, through the use of our, again, our high Q, thermally stable dielectric materials, um, specialized construction techniques, uh, just different on the LE versus the SSS. Uh, from a mechanical standpoint, uh, again, achievable, uh, achieved with a, a more compact construction, uh, using lightweight aluminum housings, very similar in the, to the SSS. Uh, and also using specialized plating. Uh, in this case, uh, maybe straight electroplated silver, uh, perhaps otherwise using some selected plating, uh, silver and gold, uh, silver chromate, gold chromate, uh, depending on which combination we need in order to enhance low loss uh, and, and some of the assembly techniques that are going to be required for this. Uh, so from a, a performance standpoint, uh, over temperature, uh, it's more of a choice of the components and, and unique techniques to compensate for changes that are going to be inherent to these components uh, over temperature. Uh, but that just comes from, uh, from designing those, those parameters in. Moving on to the actual design side on the SSS. The SSS is really cascaded, right? So we've got these, these uh, high-pass, low-pass sections that we cascade. So this design utilizes a distributed network of generalized Chebyshev prototypes. So th these include uh, our open circuits, which are in the low-pass section. And you'll see that we've got these in here uh, almost schematically uh, for that. Um, we've got our, our in our high pass side, we've got our uh, short circuit stubs, and then uh, we've got our digital section uh, in here that that is going to help clean things up for us electrically. Uh, now all of these are printed on a on a double sided circuit board, uh, so there is uh, there is more to talk about on this uh, electrically, uh, but that that's that's schematically what we're looking at. So how, do, how does that translate to, to performance? In this case, this graph shows a real-world performance um, and a significant improvement over the spec goals. Uh, if, if you're going, we go down through this list of our loss, uh, our loss spec was 1.5. We're running anywhere between 0.4 and 1 dB. Uh, the rejection goal was 50 dB. We're running anywhere between 65 on the low pass and 58 on the high pass. And as far as the, the uh, VSWR, we're, we're in the range of, you know, 1.4 uh, 
uh, Visoire versus 1.6. Uh, so uh, all you know, all indicates that, that the design is moving in the right direction and, and can meet or exceed specification. On to uh, the design of the mechanical side on the chassis. You know, there's just a lot going on here with the compact design uh, and, the, and the, the, the tight constraints that, that brings. There, there's first some interferences that we had to avoid. There's, uh, as an example, uh, there are uh, mounting holes for the chassis uh, that are through holes that are in very close proximity to the mounting holes for the SMA connector that's going to go on this face. Uh, and so these are some tapped holes going through for the SMA connector, and these are clearance holes for screws going down to mount the chassis down. And they're very, very tight. And of course, there's really not much you can do uh, in order to, uh, when your spec is for an SMA connector, uh, there's really not much you can do to uh, avoid that when your width is only 0.55 and your flange is 0.5. So um, looking at that, we also have inside of these, for the, the pockets for all of the resonators and stubs, uh, we have some very, very small uh, radiuses that have to be machined into these surfaces. And there's machined into the surfaces of the housing, and then there's a cover that goes over the top because the printed circuit board is double-sided. So the pockets have to be double-sided. So we've got radii that are as small as 0 0.016 inches and pockets that are as shallow as 0 0.022 inches. Uh, there are obviously larger ones, and they, they vary. Uh, but all these dimensions uh, and, and the tolerances that go along with them, they're pretty tight. Uh, apply after plating. Uh, so a cumulative stack of tolerance uh, has to be considered during the engineering process. And in this case, plating ended up being a QQS 365 silver with 300 to 500 micro inches, uh, which just means you have to tightly control the design and then tightly control the plating process. Moving on a little more mechanical on, on the PCBA side, uh, the material itself is a, is a duroid material, uh, so it's very thin at 0 .005 inches. Um, and the SSS filters, speaking of that, that use a minimum of dielectric material, the thickness of the material. And this has the effect of minimizing dielectric losses in the pass band and increasing the temperature stability of the filters. There are other positive features with this type of filter design. Um, the, the length of individual elements in the SS circuit is greater than the length of equivalent elements in ordinary strip line circuits. So at high frequency, SSS circuits don't really suffer from compression of the component size. And the external capabilities or tuning capabilities can be incorporated in, into the design then. Um, this eliminates the, the necessity for circuit trimming um, or tuning otherwise to achieve uh, desired performance, which is really where we want to get to, right? This is a, a simple des mechanical design uh, to be able to assemble. Uh, we don't want to go back in there and have to start tuning these things. Uh, a lot of that comes down to the, the quality of the manufacturing on the printed circuit board side, which is registration. So in this case, we have a very, very tight registration of 0 .001 front to back. Uh, really difficult to achieve with a Teflon-based material that's soft and moves around under manufacturing. Um, but there are things we can use with laser drill, laser route, and some other ways of controlling registration that help us achieve that. Um, the plated through ground placement, um, ground hole placement, uh, is very critical for rejection uh, and, and continuous, contiguous visoire performance. Uh, and that really gives us that ground plane uh, and its skin effect uh, to as the, the signal runs back and forth through this, the, the circuit. Uh, and then we've got a silver uh, finish on this, which is an immersion silver, uh, which adds to the solderability. Uh, because in here, we've got a, a really three in this, this area up here. We've got three uh, thermal management chips that we use to pull heat off of these uh, resonators and, and pull that, that heat into ground. Um, and then we've got some, obviously, a launch pin coming off of the board uh, on either end in order to get out into our SMA launch. So our LE design schematically comes out as a nine-pole, individual LCs, 
Uh, it's important to note here that this is an, as a design, um, that, that it was, you start with an ideal design, uh, meaning that there's no parasitics and an infinite Q components. But these components don't really exist. So we try to take what is a effectively, you know, real world components and create a simulation of the filter by using component models that have finite Qs and, and parasitics to them. So we start off with high power specification, which then requires us to use appropriate air wound coils and, and chip capacitors uh, to realize the, the series inductors, uh, shunt inductors, uh, shunt capacitors, shunt, shunt uh, or, or series capacitors. Um, and, and bottom line is you have to choose these of size versus power because it's fairly high power. That means that, that the, the physical size of the components are larger, uh, which makes them all tunable, but then they're more difficult to install because you've got more of them. Uh, you've, you've got to manage, obviously, lots of soldering. Uh, so we end up with a nine pole that we believe is going to give us the best performance relative to the size of the housing that and, and design space that we have. So based on that initial assessment, we end up with some specifications that give us really a rejection spec at the top end that's out. So if you look at this, we end up with a, at the low end, which is where the lumped element does really, really well. It's got a fairly sharp rejection. At the high end, it tends to curve out, gets pretty lazy, and it tends to get, it gets out of spec here at the uh, 6 gigahertz plus. So the, the loss itself is, is in spec. Uh, the, the VSWR is in spec, and that's all good. So the question is, how do we get this thing in spec over here in the rejection? Well, what it really needs, instead of a nine pole, is a 10 pole, or maybe 11, add a couple more poles into this design in order for the high side uh, to come into spec. But the problem is, because of the size of the components relative to the power handling capabilities, we need more space. Uh, so that's, that's where the trade-off begins now. Once we get into the, the design side of this on the mechanical, uh, we need more space. So how do we get more space? Well, there's a lot of things to consider to get that. The, on the chassis side, the RF shielding. We've got component placement and RF shielding within the enclosure, and, and those are critical to effectively reduce the inherent coupling between inductors and capacitors. So the more poles we jam into this thing, the more inherent coupling uh, or co-site interference of those components that we're going to have. So uh, the component placement can assist in, in reducing the effects of coupling. When the inductors are co-located, the coils can be placed at right angles to each other uh, or, or, or various angles to each other or wound in opposite directions. Uh, and, th and there's other methods to keep the coils as far apart from each other as possible. Um, but bottom line is both methods, we, we must be mindful of the lead placement, um, the capacitor location, uh, all relative to possible distributed inductance uh, within, within the body of this thing. Um, one method is to offset, uh, to, to offset that is to reduce the line width or length of the PCB trace. Uh, but at the same time, then we affect potentially uh, impedance and we affect power handling capability. So it's all a trade-off in this sense. Uh, the, the capacitor orientation uh, can also, again, be, be maximized by mounting the components in vertical orientations versus horizontal. Uh, and again, the inductors can be mounted in, in uh, areas that are that are off angle to each other, uh, but but all of it is a trade off in order to reduce the co located uh, cross coupling. You can reduce a little bit of that with the mechanical shielding. So if you much like in the way the SSS is designed, uh, we we have effectively a a drop in here which gives us walls and channels to be able to direct some of the RF energy away from each pole and isolate those things mechanical and have a mechanical shielding. Generally, we achieve that by isolating them with uh, a fully enclosed cavity, but we can't do that uh, because the circuitry runs through. So the mechanical shielding can be achieved by creating, a, a like this in this case, a network of machined pockets or, or um, areas that uh, each inductor or capacitor network can live. 
Um, it, it'll complicate the design. It can also use up real estate, uh, but it can also yield, you know, very good results. Uh, and if we, as long as we maintain continuous continuous grounding, and we use uh, the best plating uh, choices possible. So again, another trade-off in the LE: trying to find space. Uh, relative to adding in poles uh, to meet electrical performance. Looking at the PCBA on, on the lumped element, uh, it's a thicker material, uh, O32, uh, and it's, and it's a, a woven glass reinforced ceramic substrate, so it means it's very stable. Uh, unlike the uh, SSS, which is a very, very thin material and moves around a lot in manufacturing, uh, this is a much easier material to manufacture. Um, there is a uh, much more relaxed uh, registration spec, and that's because the back, the, the, the opposite side of the board from the circuit is, is a full ground plane. Uh, we also use a very uh, heavier uh, one ounce copper as opposed to a plated up half ounce copper on the SSS. Um, and that's really for durability during component soldering uh, for the most part. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of parts going down, so we, we want to make sure that that's that uh, we pay attention to that. Um, an immersion silver finish uh, will give us the best performance uh, for electrical as well as mechanical performance because it becomes it's very solderable. Um, and again, with the electrical, it's, it's, it's low loss. Um, and in, to, in, in order to finish the installation, uh, because we have got a, a contiguous ground plane there on the board, uh, we'll need to either solder, and we'll have to make the choice to either solder or electrically uh, or have electrically conductive epoxy uh, either way, uh, we just need to maximize the use of the, the, of the ground plane surface uh, for our performance. So to summarize the SSS, uh, our, our design meets all mechanical requirements, which is great. We've got a mechanical footprint, we've got the connectors, we've got the mounting holes, everything, everything meets spec. It, it actually exceeds all of the electrical expectations, uh, every one of them. It, it provides a margin that's significant beyond the spec. And due to the structure, as we talked about, it's a very stable uh, platform over temperature, electrically and mechanically, good CTE. On the assembly side, um, it, it's, a very, it's a very efficient uh, part. It's got a low component count. Uh, really, there's only eight solder operations which means there's less hand touch overall uh, on, on the board. There's less hand touch on the assembly of the board into the housing. Um, that means there's less to inspect. Um, there's little to no tuning on this type of a part, um, which also makes it very highly repeatable, as, 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 as we'll see from a printed circuit board that, that is uh, tightly controlled. Uh, again, highly repeatable. All this goes back to the point of, of having something that is highly reliable, uh, highly repeatable, uh, and, and stable. Now looking at the LE summary, on the other hand, um, we see that the BSWR and, and loss, they, they were decent, uh, but the high pass rejection was a bit marginal. Um, we weren't really able to get a additional pull into the filter because of the mechanical constraints. Um, and, and because of the mechanical shielding that would, we would need inside of there. Um, so it would really come down to more tuning, uh, which was tunable, uh, but, but a lot of tuning. Uh, this could meet the mechanical spec, but again, the footprint really needed to be larger to accommodate more poles to achieve the electrical performance required, but we just didn't have latitude to go to a larger footprint. Um, the lumped element components experience more CTE uh, in thermal loading, and therefore they're less stable, they're less predictable than the printed structures of the SSS. Um, there is a high component count, um, so there are many solder connections. Uh, each inductor requires manual tuning. That's a, a, a huge time um, investment. Um, there's less consistent results because they are manually tuned, uh, each, each inductor. Uh, so there, there's a lot of things in there that, that go against the lumped element design. Um, and so in the end, 
um, the SSS becomes a clear design winner. So before we get back to the Q&A, uh, we'll be going back to Kendall for a few minutes. Uh, Kendall? Thank you, Mark. Well, Mark reviewed the questions that came in. I wanted to briefly mention some of the additional PCB-based products we offer here at EPIC. Those include custom battery packs, flex and rigid flex print circuit boards, high reliability user interfaces and cable assemblies, and our energy efficient fans and motors. Next slide, please. Just as an overview of where we build each of those products, our battery pack and power management is located in Denver, Colorado. Our smart user interfaces are located in Largo, Florida. Our flex and rigid flex is located in Toronto, Canada. All of our RF products are here in New Bedford, Massachusetts, as well as in Largo, Florida. Our cable assemblies are also in Largo. And our printed circuit board business is in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Shenzhen, China. Um, for all of those products, we have engineering and design teams, just like Mark, that are ready to help all of our customers um, from design through the process into production. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark one last time to go through questions. Thank you. Thanks again, Kendall. Uh, so here we are at the Q&A uh, portion of this thing. Um, we've got a lot of questions. Uh, we are uh, on to our first one here. What are the development time differences? Uh, well, as you can imagine, you two, we have two totally different designs. Um, their design time differences are pretty significant, uh, with the SSS being significantly more. Uh, in this case, the, the time differential would be driven by the DFM process, uh, the number of revisions required to get to a full rate production. Um, you know, our yields on something, uh, really any product, we want to be in the 95 plus range. So I think if you go back and look at this particular SSS, you know, there could be 9, 10, 11 spins on it to get it to full rate production. Um, and just as an aside, the, the lumped element design did not ever go into production, um, and the SSS did. But, but I think the estimate would be that the LE would be at least a 25% or less, uh, you know, in terms of its total design time. Um, and speaking of that a little bit on the, the what drives that is the, the design for manufacturing, or DFM, it, it's really a method of designing products to optimize all our manufacturing functions that form the final product. Um, the DFM is, is it's primarily concerned with minimizing complexity of manufacturing operations as they relate to the design um, and, and also help us shorten the product development cycle, really. Um, it, it really focuses on all phases of the process, right, from design, fabrication, uh, takes into account assembly, test, procurement, uh, even shipping and delivery, right, when you think about packaging. So our, the DFM really is what drives a lot of the development time uh, for the most part. Um, and, of course, at the end of the day, knowing the design is manufacturable, uh, you're, you're, you're more likely to receive better, better costs, uh, better quality, overall reliability, uh, which really speaks to the fundamental requirements of the part itself. Uh, another question is, is cost a factor? Uh, well, yes, cost is always a factor, as we know, but uh, cost is really a factor in this case. Uh, I would say the cost is a factor that is born in the development stage. Uh, the SSS is way more costly to develop than the LE, um, but the, uh, the cost of the SSS development uh, can be gained back if there are larger production volumes uh, then, then the SSS uh, can return that um, in, in production versus the more complex uh, manual assembly and tuning efforts required by the lumped element. Um, and I, and I, I, I think that that's, uh, that that's a fair assessment of that uh, relative to cost. Uh, is it a factor? Yes. What's the cost? Well, that, that has to be determined. Um, We've got another, when do you choose the lower tech solution? Um, <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to call loved element low tech uh, because it has its irrefutable place in low frequency design, and that's it. You know, there's nothing that can take the place of, of uh, you know, a, a lumped element design. Um, and, it, and it's really frequency and power dependent. And the more 
the lower the frequency and the higher the power, the more you're dependent upon lumped element. Um, so it, it, it's, it's got its place in lower frequency design, but compared to SSS in this application, I guess it is low tech. Um, it, it is ultimately, though, in this case, dictated by the EAU or production volumes. So uh, ultimately, an LE uh, wins at a low volume. In this, in this particular case, if we could meet the spec um, with tuning as, as we went through the design and were successful with the design, um, we would use the low E, the, the, the lumped element uh, would, would win at a low volume, and the SSS uh, would win at a high volume. Um, so looking at the time, we're, we're running a little bit long here, um, a, little bit, a few minutes past, so I appreciate you guys hanging in there with us. Um, this was a little bit technical, so I guess it just goes a little long. But anyway, we're running a little long, so as a result, uh, we're only going to answer a few of those questions. Uh, so we'll be following up with all of you. Uh, in terms of the questions you have. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Really appreciate taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here today. Uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, like to see you again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.